great to be connecting with Chapel out west today as well as the other campuses in Auckland, then over to Australia in Adelaide and also in Melbourne. We're all connected as one large family. And I'm really believing that God is going to do something in each of our hearts. Even this week, as I was preparing my heart, I felt like there was a need for me to hear something fresh from God. And there is moments in our lives where God literally steps in and says to us, it doesn't have to be the way it's been. There is a moment when you align your life with God's word that brings a freshness. And you know, God will go to any lengths to get our attention so that he can move us forward. That's his father's heart. So we're going to pray and believe that God is going to speak to every one of us. If you're visiting, if you're online for the first time, be a part of our family today and let's hear from God. Father, we thank you today that you've given to us your word and your word declares your word is light to darkness. You bring peace to storms. You give direction when we get to the end of ourselves. And Holy Spirit, we invite you over these next few weeks as we share around some of the most important things in our human life, that you will redirect and you will change what needs to change, that we'll learn to trust you and to walk with you every step of our lives. We pray for every person today. Pray for those we're sitting next to, God, that you will bless them abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, if you are visiting here at Life, we like to, every couple of years, take some time around some of the major areas in our natural worlds. We love to have a look at things pertaining to finance. I think since day one, 30 years almost ago, we've always been committed to investigating, teaching the divine insights and the principles around how we can find freedom. How many know when you really find salvation, you find freedom, you find favor, and you discover that there is a future that is far bigger than you could ever imagine it to be. I love series when we talk about how to encounter the Holy Spirit and personally how we can get engaged with who God is. Uh, at times, in fact, we've got a series coming up around relationships and developing relational health will create a life that will change everything about you because you're living in a rich environment. The fact that here at Life, we believe everyone, that's why we have Life Leadership College, is that every one of us are called to live kingdom-purposed lives. And if you keep living in reaction to what you've been through or distracted by just the things around you, you won't discover the freedom and the enjoyment that life can be when you're on purpose. Also, I want to commit to teaching on overcoming limiting realities. And so we're going to go into the series about creating a pathway to financial freedom because I think finances are bigger than what we would care to think about. And often people would say to me over the years, well, Paul, you know, when it comes to money in church, I don't like churches talking about money, to which I have always responded, the trouble with the church is it doesn't talk about money. It talks about giving. Come on, I need you to lean in today. Because the enemy hates this kind of talk when we can break the enemy's plan off our lives and we can see God take us to a new level of freedom. Can somebody say amen about that? And there's an incredible sense that we've got to realize money determines more than we realize. If you're not finding God's plan for your material financial world, then I think you can live your entire life distracted by an excess or you can be dominated and controlled by where you find yourself. I shared a story, I think a couple of years ago when we touched on the subject of money and, and it was about a, an older couple, George and Bessie, and they lived out in the uh, kind of country and they would go annually to the country fair and of course, there were all kinds of rides and things they could do. You know, they could put the ping pong into the clown's head that was turning. But there was this plane that was there sitting on the grass tarmac. And it was an acrobatic plane. And of course, George loved planes. And every time he would say to Bessie, Bessie, I'd love to go on one of those flights. But he would say, I know it costs $10. Bessie would reply and say, yeah, well, $10 is $10. But after many years, as he would go every time to where the plane was and desire he could do it, 
He now said, Bessie, you're gonna realise that I'm 81 years of age. If we don't get to ride this plane soon, we'll never get a chance to be on the plane. Bessie replied, George, you know that aeroplane costs $10 and $10 is $10. Well, the pilot overheard them and had seen them there previous years. And he says, folks, I hear you always debating about whether to come on the plane or not. Listen, I'll make you a deal. What I'll do is I'll take you both up in the plane and if you can keep quiet for the whole ride, you won't have to spend $10. However, one word, one squeal is gonna cost you $10. Well, they agreed, they hopped in the plane and George and Bessie took off, they went up and then the pilot began to twist and roll and drop and rise and uh, there wasn't a peep and the pilot sort of said as they were coming down to land, he said, wow, you guys are amazing. I thought I would get you somehow because of how I flow in this plane. But you didn't say a word. Then George said, I, I was gonna say something when Bessie fell out. <laughs> but $10 is $10. And seriously, we, we come to church, listen to this, and in our naivety, we go, you know what, I, I don't need teaching on money because I've got a whole lot. You need teaching on money if you have a whole lot. Did you know that God wants to take your life and change the generational footprint of every born again believer? And you might say, yeah, but I'm still not convinced. Well, how much is money leading you? We're gonna go there. How much is money dictating to you about your current life and circumstances? Do you live financially free? Have you discovered a pathway, a plan that you can put in place that will literally liberate you? So a couple of thoughts about money because I'm gonna lay a platform over the next few weeks. We're gonna get into more detail and I really wanna get practical. Can you say amen to that? But just a couple of thoughts. Did you know that money builds and destroys? So therefore, money is not a passive entity in our lives. Proverbs 11 verse 10 says this, when it goes well, the Bible says, when it goes well with the righteous, those that belong to God, even the city begins to rejoice. I wonder sometimes if here in Auckland and in Melbourne, obviously in Adelaide, in all of the locations that we're in, as God is unlocking His truth, our city becomes a better place because of us. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. That word blessing is not a feeling. Literally in the original language, by the liberal pull, and I wanna put it out there, by the prosperity of God's children, the city begins to see light, find a future, and begin to turn around. Wow, it's quiet in here. You know why? Because the enemy knows that if he can hold you and I in a place of imbalance when it comes to material things, we cannot change the city that we live in. So people say to me all the time, because they know I've written a book called God, Money and Me, they say, well, do you believe in prosperity? I said, of course I believe in it. It's a Bible name. I don't believe in some of the nuances. What's the word? Nuances. Let's call them nuances. Well, where people are going, you know what? God just wants to make you rich so you can live what you wanna live and just care about you. That's not what the Bible teaches, but God says, I wanna teach you how to disempower the enemy and his plan on your financial material world. And that's why whenever I come up to a series, I feel this agitation in my spirit and I am convinced that the enemy is weary because when you begin to get God's word on it, you begin to remove the shadow the lies that he has used. So money empowers and destroys. You go to Proverbs and Proverbs chapter eleven twenty eight. 28. However, the one that trusts in their material riches and their material possessions will fall. The righteous, however, will flourish like foliage. I'm not sure if you've walked out into the garden when you come into spring and We've got some fruit trees. It's amazing. Every time I walk past them, there's new foliage. 
It's kind of like something's happening that's liberating. And so money, not only does it build, it destroys. When you have a lot of it and you don't understand God's plan for it, it's gonna dominate you by the distraction that money can buy. I'll never forget a family that was a part of life and this isn't a judgment, it's an observation. They were very much a part of the family and then before we knew it, they were gone. I said to somebody, where have they gone? They said, oh, they've gone to another city because he's got a job that's paying a whole lot more money. I don't know all the ins and outs, but what I can tell you, it was less than 18 months before their marriage was over, before the job was not what they thought it would be before they couldn't find a church that they felt comfortable in and they were very much alone and all of those things kind of were a mixture of a cocktail. That if God wasn't in that move, but money was making that move. Come on, it's gonna, it is gonna get quiet over the next few weeks. If money is leading us, then it's not gonna lead us towards God. The enemy has a stronghold over it and Basically, I'm asking you as we lay a platform, what's making your major decisions? Who, who or what is your decision maker? Is it literally the things of this world or is it a God that wants to lead us forward? So money empowers and destroys, but money also releases and controls. There is a release that comes with money and there's a control when we are living in a perpetual state of negative debt. Proverbs 22, seven, the rich rules over the poor. The borrower is servant to the lender. As I said, both lack and excess can dominate us. And I believe that it's time for us to discover how we can break off disempowering, controlling debt. Not all debt is bad, but debt, if you're serving it, is controlling you. If it's serving you, you're moving forward. So practically, we're gonna look at that as we go in and move forward. And so I found myself having to discover that we've got some of the answers, but not a full picture. Galatians 6 and verse seven, don't be deceived, God said. You can be in church every week, you can have a position, you could be somebody that others look up to, but you still can be in deception over certain areas. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. The principle that he has put in place is that whatever we sow, we will reap. So if we sow into the area of allowing financial things to determine our decisions, we're gonna reap from that spirit. Don't be deceived. Literally, the word is don't be led astray. You know, you can be on course. That's why every two years I'm fully committed to coming back to the subject of money. You can be on course and maybe even doing most of it right, but you're without even knowing it, you've been led a little off course. Do you still feel the challenge when God says, hey, that part's mine. And you go, yeah, but that's a lot of money. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You start doing it God's way, then you are also gonna reap from God's way. Imagine what the church could be like in society. Imagine in Melbourne, imagine in Adelaide, imagine here in Auckland, what could happen through all of us if we were without limitation, financial limitation, and we had done it God's way, how we could bring an answer to poverty. You imagine the difference you can make to those in your neighborhood. When people don't understand, and I am absolutely, I hope you get it today, 100% passionate about liberating what the enemy is using. And when you sit there or I sit there and go, I've heard all this before, I've preached on this, I've written a book on this. And I go, oh, I understand all of this. No, I don't. I'm a human and I get to drift. I get to find that there are decisions that I'm not making that God wants me to make. But what I realized around ver these verses in Galatians 6, 7 and further on is that many things, I want you to hear this, are beyond my control, but harvest is not one of them. You might go, yeah, but Paul, you don't understand the, the family I came from. You don't understand our current situations. I don't, but... Once you settle the word of God is God's word, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, whatever a man sows. Harvest is not beyond your ability to implement. You want a harvest of richer friendships. What does God say? Sow friendly seeds. You want better preaching on Sunday? 
so responsive seats. Oh, I didn't get much out of that. Yeah, that's because you were a dead hair in the seats, not saying anything, not doing it. I shouldn't say that really, should I? But this verse literally became a turning point for me. Listen to it again. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, here it is, that he shall also reap. I was only taught in church to sow. Just give, give. And as I began to think about that, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got half the truth. But if you're a farmer, you prepare the ground and you put the seed in the ground, but you know where the most work happens? Is reaping. It's the ability to go, hey, this is a whole equation here. And so I'm committing to put energy to make sure I'm not just sowing, but I'm going to see a harvest begin to build around me so then I have a perpetual ability to do more for the kingdom and see the power of God to take me to new levels. And I believe that God's promises have a need to be unwrapped. So we just sit there and pray and say, God, would you bless me financially? God says, no, the principal son is sow and reap. Make sure that you learn how to do both of those. And in the weeks to come, we're gonna unpack that deeply because if we don't learn how to reap, we'll never get free. And I know that God is stirring us as a church because we are on this pathway of seeing our world breaking down and the church is the hope of the world and the church is the key to society. So let's not just embrace the law of sowing, but also of reaping. Isaiah 28 verse 23 in the Message Bible. Listen to me now, says God. Give me your closest attention. Do farmers plow and plow and do nothing but plow? Or harrow, that's prepare the ground and harrow, and do nothing but harrow. After they, they have prepared the ground, don't they plant? Don't they scatter dill and spread, come in and plant wheat and barley in the fields and raspberries along the borders? They know exactly what to do and when to do it. Their God is their teacher. Not their university degree. Not the seeming absoluteness of where we find ourselves. God is their teacher. God is taking us all on a journey of how do we create this pathway to financial freedom. I want to start out week one by talking about some of the misunderstandings we have about money. Things that aren't quite true and yet the enemy uses them at time. I think one of the big ones would be this, that financial freedom is only for some. Oh, it's okay for you. It's okay for you. Marie and I turned up in New Zealand 30 years ago. Our complete asset base was $4,000. We used that $4,000 to buy five tickets to get to Auckland and to bring some gear with the money that was left over to start what we believe was a God call. It would be easy to say, well, it's okay for them because they've got the assets. People look at our lives today and again, we're not wealthy people, but God has blessed us. And people go, wow, wow, you've got a nice home up there in Fongaparoa and it's a reasonable home and we've developed it and we continue to develop it. We love it, we're thankful for it. But it's easy to buy into because I did that. It's like, this is not for us. Maybe this is for other people. It's kind of like what they do with baby elephants if they are to be kept in the circus. And, you know, we've got all different views on that, but they will put a chain around the baby elephant's leg and tie it to a post that where it's at today, it can't shift it. The elephant walks around and every time it tries to break out, it realizes there's something too strong that's holding it there. But the elephant continues to grow as it continues to eat. And they have now realized they don't need a chain on the bigger elephant, they just need a rope. Because they have bought into a lie that I can't get free. Seriously, this is gonna be one of the most important series for us to not be distracted no matter where we're at because God is wanting to say, I wanna take you to a new level of freedom. 
And to buy into this misunderstanding that it's only for some. In fact, Jesus said in John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you do it my way, if you abide in my word, if you take hold of the truth of my word, then you'll become a disciple indeed. Remember, previously, God is our teacher. And you will know the truth. And what will the truth do? Set you free. Seriously, that's not just for salvation. Come on, that's for everything that's happened in your past. God can set you free. Every limitation around your life. That word free, by the way, is to liberate you. To realize that you don't have to stay where you are. And there are future generations that are longing for you to begin to reset your life. So here's Marie and my deal. 15 years married. Life is bliss. Marie's been married up. I've married up. We're doing well. But you know what? We were only taught to sow. So every time, two wages, we would give to areas and people in need. I remember 15 years on, I'm 38. I go, God, if we ever entertain getting a house in New Zealand, it'd be impossible. We've got nothing. And I kind of said to God, God, there's got to be more in your word than what I've heard because we're not breaking through. We're happy to do it. We're only here for a short period of time and then we're in eternity, but there must be something that we're missing. So you can be generous, but still constantly lack because you're missing something. And what God did is he took us to 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. And this has become the heart of God, money and me. And for us, a life-changing revelation. Not only should we sow, we need to reap. Then you bring that into this verse, verse 8. God is able. Everybody say able. able. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is able. God is able. In other words, you are not someone. That's a special case. That's what I'm saying. Failure freedom is not only for some. It's for all of us. God is able to make all grace abound. Oh, man, I need to be south today. Abound, north today, come on, abound. What's God like? Oh, he's stingy. What's God like? Oh, you know, he's limited in his ability. No, God is able to make all grace abound. Grace for salvation. Grace for healing of your past. Grace to empower you for the future he's calling you to do. Grace financially. That you always, that's where I stop when I'm reading this. I'm going, whoa, always? Having all sufficiency? In all things? A lot of all in there. Would have an abundance for every good work. So Paul, whenever you see a need, God's purpose for your lives is that you can contribute. I could do something there. I could do something there. I can do something. I travel globally and Marie and I love the fact that we are a part of other people's missions and dreams personally because we can just say, we can do something. But this was a shifting point because I thought, God, we're not that place. God is able to make all grace. Again, the word is favour. Did you know as a Christian, God wants you to be favoured. Don't buy into a mentality that it's wrong to be favoured. Bring all liberality is that grace, all sufficiency as I have shared many times. It's a perfect condition is the literal translation. A perfect condition of living where you don't need any aid or support. So I take that and I go, so God's ultimate plan is that I would be a resource carrier for good works. That I and Marie and you are in God's plan, every one of us would be someone that doesn't need to work for money. Because you have all sufficiency in all things. You work for your purpose in God. The byproduct is money, but God through the generations has brought his word into play and now you are standing on the understanding of former generations that haven't just lived for themselves or stayed in a place of controlling debt, but they have began to prepare the way so that we can live financially free to be able to bring an answer to the world that's crying out, is there a God that could take care of me? Sufficiency, a perfect condition of life so that you would have an abundance to super amount. Well, I still don't like talk about money. That's because money's got us. Superabound in quality and in quantity to be in excess to exceed. So that's where we could all sit and go, hey, well, maybe there is something that God wants to take me. 
I remember back then going, wow. Wow, that's not just a verse that I go, hey, that was a cool verse this morning. This is a life-defining truth. See, we had been living with this imbalanced view. And, and for many of us, it's confusion or control that has taken hold of our lives. And I'm saying to all of us, this is Bible. This isn't Paul. This is God that's speaking. 3 John in verse 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Be in health just as your soul prospers. What's your soul? What's your thinking? It's a redefining and aligning of your soul. Financial freedom is a God idea for you, for your kids. Yeah, but I haven't seen it. Well, hey, I can relate to that, but there's a shift that God's wanting to bring because the thief comes not but to kill and to steal and to kill, but I, I am come that you may have a life. And you have it abundantly. Maybe it's not as strong in Australia, but here in New Zealand, come on, that tall poppy, it's like, who am I to be blessed? You're a child of God, and God in his Father's heart wants to bless you abundantly. The word abundantly, over more than is necessary. That's where God wants to take us. So one of those challenges or misunderstandings is, I think financial freedom is only for some. The second would be this, is I don't need more money. Serious? Serious? Why would you say that? Oh, well, we've got a great business and maybe we had generations that set a foundation and, and we've been blessed and things are going well for us. Did you realize that God created you to become a river, not a dam? Did you realize there are people today, I still get moved by the kids dying of starvation. There are people today that are still looking for an answer, something that would happen. You see, to be happy with what you have is a very selfish attitude. And God is saying, come on, the, the, the gospel releases us. All I have, all I need is what I've got. No money can unlock so much more. It's kind of like here in New Zealand 30 years ago when we arrived. It's, uh, you know, the, the attitude was like, well, we don't need people outside. We just, we've got what we want. And all we need is a new move of God. And I go, yeah, we need a move of God for sure. And He needs to move you before He can move through you. It's kind of like we need a move of God and, and, and we need God to move powerfully. It's all, no, all we need is a new baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit baptizes us so that the fruit of the Spirit begins to transform us. So then we can begin to implement the principles of God and bring a change. I'll never forget when Greg Laurie contacted us and said, hey, we'd love to come from America. He's an evangelist and do a big crusade in Auckland. Would you like us to come? We said, we'd love you to come. Got in touch with a whole lot of churches. This is the early years of life. And I said, would you be interested? Oh yeah, that'd be awesome to have a salvation, soul winning crusade. He turns up pre the crusade with a few of his um, colleagues and they're here in Auckland and we have a pre-crusade meeting. And so in that pre-crusade meeting, some of you may have heard this story. It's like, let's take up an offering towards the crusade. Uh oh, this is New Zealand. So we took up the offering. I remember like yesterday, I either put 300 or $500 into the plate because we were desperate for people to come to Christ. At the end of the meeting, I said to whoever was looking at it, how did the offering go? Oh, pretty good. I said, how did it go? 2,500. What's 2,500 gonna be for a major citywide crusade? Do you know that Greg Laurie and their Harvest Church in California put in $150,000 into that crusade? My response is, we weren't ready for it. I know I'm going hard out. It's kind of like, we don't need more money, don't we? I think money says to vision, I can release you. We don't need more money. No, money says to need, I can help you. Yeah, we don't need more money. No, money says to those in debt, I can free you. Did you know that money says to time, I can release you? And I think sometimes we've just got to reset the way we see it. Everyone in this room needs God to bless them more abundantly so they can become a river for the purpose of the king. 
The third misunderstanding about money is that the Bible teaches money is evil. Does it? Which Bible are you reading? See, the enemy understands the outcome of financial freedom in the church. That's why there is so much attack on it. Of course, the classic verse that this misunderstanding comes from is 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money. Don't ever think you can't succumb to the love of money. For the love of money will take you to another city without God saying it's the right thing. For the love of money will cause you to multiply and you get wrapped up now because all of your time is taking in money. As the thing grows and you're not building your true God purpose. The love of money is the offspring, the progeny of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and they end up with many sorrows. I just defined how I understand the love of money. It seeks a priority focus. The love of money becomes the final decision maker. The love of money gives birth to distraction and drift. The love of money has an agenda to ultimately take the lead in our lives. Previous verse to that verse is verse six. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Remember you brought nothing into this world and certainly you're not gonna carry anything out. If you have food and clothing, be content with these things because those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and sneer. I love this quote, do not value money for any more nor any less than it's worth. It truly is a good servant, but a bad master. Instruct those who are rich, 1 Timothy 6 verse 17. Those who have good money in this present world, don't get conceited. Don't fix your hope on uncertain riches, but let your hope, your trust, your lean and be on God who, here it is again, richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. This thought that God wants to take us to a place, very simple illustration about money is a little bit like a fire. If you love fires and you're still allowed to do them in the city in which you live, and you've got a good fireplace and the chimney's clean. It's an incredible feeling to have that fire just going in the background. There's atmosphere, there's warmth, there's power. You take that same fire and put it in a place that it wasn't designed for. If money is leading your decisions, come on. Rather than God wanting to release something through you, that same fire can burn down what was so beautiful at the start. And I gotta say hand on heart, my observation of those that have done well financially, globally, by and large in the church are living distracted from their kingdom core. And we're gonna go into that. Why is that the case next week? How come that has so much authority? So financial freedom is only for some we think, I don't need more money. The Bible teaches money is evil. Here's another one and I'll close on this. Misunderstandings about money is that Jesus modeled a life of living with little. You know, I've heard all sorts of things. Well, you, you, you want to analyze the garment he had at the crucifixion. They would have paid a lot of money, so he was wealthy. That doesn't prove he was wealthy. But this thought that Jesus did live materially a very simple life. What we need to realize is that he was on a specific mission from heaven. And there are seasons that some of us are called to do things differently for a greater purpose. You say, yeah, but that sounds a little bit watered down. Well, let me give you biblically why he lived a life of living with little. That was not that he was modeling that for us to live like that. In fact, verse nine of 2 Corinthians eight, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, well, that's not rich, rich. No, 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 that's material. The word rich, abounding in material resources, abundantly supplied, abounding also in Christian virtues and eternal possessions. Settle it. Some of us are gonna get embarrassed when we get to heaven and we see the grandeur of what God can create and yet there's not a spirit of greed. Though he was rich, I've had to say this, yet for Paul Andrew de Jong's life, he became poor. That 
Every one of you through his poverty might be rich. Jesus was mad beyond recognition. Spat upon, broken down, humanly speaking. And we accept that he did that so that we could be free. Don't take this area of material and financial possessions according to what's in the media. Don't go online and let that shape you. Go to God's word and say, God, you lived a life of little. You didn't model that for me. You did it so that we could break through. So we could abound and powerful that. Yeah, but the disciples were told to go and do ministry with nothing. We would tell our life leadership college students to have a season where you've got nothing and you just trust God. You're building your trust in God. But it's not the overarching plan of God for us. God called Marie and I three times in our life to give away everything we owned. But that's not the overarching plan that He has. That's an obedience point where we've come in and said, we'll do it. And you say, yeah, but the disciples had nothing. Listen to what Jesus said to them. He answered and said in Mark chapter 10, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left a house, a brother, a sister, a father, mother, wife, children, or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this life and also in the age to come. David understood it in the Old Testament. 1 Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honour come from you. You reign over all, God. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. Wow. As we enter a new season as a church of seeing our community impact, be in excess of 20 million a year and growing to far bigger than that. God is saying, you know, when I can trust you with more, there's more I can do. I believe that God is calling the church to become a voice in society to reinstate value and hope. I said, I believe that God is calling the church, everyone at life, all of us to be a voice of value and hope. It's gonna take resources to do it God's way. I believe God wants centers of righteousness in Adelaide and Melbourne here in Auckland where it's like, wow, that's a church? Yeah, of course it's a church. It's a community center because all of us have realized that there is a pathway. We can create a pathway to financial freedom. So many misunderstandings about money. Next week, I wanna talk about the authority of our decision. The authority of our decision. I wanna encourage everybody at life over the next few weeks in our groups, we are going to go through the God, Money and Me curriculum. In fact, for everyone that's part of life, we wanna give you an updated copy. This is a revised version of God, Money and Me. And so there is one for every family. If you come and you're just an individual that comes, there's one for you. If you come as a couple, there's one for you as a couple, one for a family. And we're gonna encourage you to take this to groups and begin to study. I've done four videos that are gonna help understand how we begin to unlock. See, the enemy needs us to shift his perspective. And again, you can hear it on Sunday, but you have gotta read and we've gotta talk about some of the things to help us really reset the future. That's why you gotta create a pathway. And so you can get one of those. Also, I've uh, also done it on audio book on the Life app. You get my voice. And so you might uh, rather have an audio book. Well, then you go on the Life um, app and you can download that so you can listen to it in the car. But I wanna encourage everybody to be a part of their four weeks of curriculum. And you pick those up and begin to read it. There's five sections in the book and it's gonna help you, I believe, seriously unlock what God's called us to do. And so we're gonna pray and we're gonna stand. In fact, why don't we stand right across life? How many would say to me, you know what, Paul, I do need a readjustment when it comes to my financial material world. Give me a wave, come on. Most of us should be in that place. Not all of us, maybe some of us feel like that. I feel for us, for Marie and I, it's kind of like God is constantly shifting because I'm focusing on it. Just look at this, look at Papa P for a moment. 
it's going to require intentionality. It's got such a stronghold. You're going to be really intentional to say, God, if it's in your Word, I'm going to start to reset. And we sang a song and we're going to go back to the campuses with a song, but they say, who are they? They say, mountains can't move. They say, this can't change because it's been like this for generations. God says, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. And I want you to sing it. Father, we pray in Jesus' Name that as we come into the series, every distraction lie of the enemy will be exposed. Hope will be born and we will declare Your greatness. In Jesus' Name. God, we believe. God, we believe in it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. Move the immovable. Break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. We believe. We believe. You know, just in this moment, I know that there's so much in there, so much great teaching and so much for some of us go, oh, I really want to go and just look into that for myself and unpack it. I couldn't encourage it. We're just championing you to do that in your walk and in your way. But I can't help but when Pastor Paul talked about the illustration of how they restricted larger elephants, that it all started when they were young. And the truth of it is the larger elephant could easily break the rope and could easily pull the peg. But because of what it's been told and conditioned to, It never tries. And I just felt for some of us, this is going to be a season when we're going to pull the peg. You're still going to, even though you're at a size and you have a new revelation and understanding of God's authority in your life, doesn't mean you don't still have to break the rope. The element still, the elephant, even though it can, doesn't mean it's not tied up, but it's got to break the rope. At some point it's going to say, I don't want to stay in the element or the restriction of where I've been for so long. I'm going to break the rope. I'm actually gonna pull the peg and maybe for a season it's pulling the peg and having the rope still attached until it gets caught on something else and you finally get to break it once and for all. But what the Word does tell us is how do we come into that point? It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Then you will see and you will test and approve to His good. It's a good will He's got for you. His perfect, wow, perfect and pleasing will for your life. Father, I just pray on top of what has been spoken and what has been imparted into us today. Father, for people here in the room or those at home joining in, God, that this would be a season of breaking the road and pulling the peg. God, whatever it might have been, maybe it's been things that have been actually shared to us or taught to us through generational inheritance or maybe the fear of wanting to actually see an abundance in our life and thinking that that would be an area of greed. No, God, we lift our eyes to a bigger vision to realise it's actually not for us, but it's what You wanna do through us. God, we pray for a fresh kingdom mantle to rest on people, that we'd be unashamed that You've actually called us to shine a light that brings about true change and true hope and true breakthrough. Father, I pray, God, though it does start in us, that we would be able to have the strength to break through into all that You have. Father, I thank You for the grace to do it. I thank You for the wisdom to do it. And I thank You, Lord, that we're not alone. I pray this in the Name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen, amen. Come on, one more time. Can we just honour God for today? And He's so good. You're looking forward to the rest.